Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is .org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 10th, 2018, and my guest is author and economist Ed Dolan, and your fellow at the NISC. Cannon Center. Ed, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me on. Our topic for today is employer sponsored health insurance. And it, we're basing the conversation on a recent essay you've written that we'll link to called What's Wrong with Employer Sponsored Health Insurance? And let's begin with some basic important a phenomenon is uh, people getting their health insurance through their uh, employer. How unusual is it compared to, say, other countries? It's a uh, very Important in the United States, uh, half of all people who have health insurance in the United States get it through their employer. And uh, this is a system that, as far as I know, is unique in the world, certainly unique among all of them, no other major countries that I know of that tie health insurance to a job. Which is crazy. Uh, why do you think? some different theories about it, but why do you think uh, America? Well, there's a little bit of controversy about that, but the predominant theory is that this was an accidental outcome of a wartime policy during World War II. During World War II, there were strict controls to prevent inflation, and that and there was also a labor shortage since uh, all the men were overseas fighting. And so employers who wanted to attract and raise wages to do it, so they started offering fringe benefits like health care being one of the main ones. Um, <clears throat> at first, it was ambiguous whether or not these, uh, these fringe benefits would be taxed as income for income tax. But um, after the war, um, there was a decision made that they would not be taxed, it would be taxation because people didn't want these benefits, uh, the benefit of the income tax exemption taken away from them since they'd already become widespread. So that basically just stayed. Uh, but then also after the war, uh, President Truman made a big push to get some kind of national health insurance, but that fell short. And by the time that had happened, uh, employer sponsored health insurance as a tax deductible benefit was so well established challenged it since there have been some people i would say in the last 10 to 20 years who have pointed out that it's not a very good way to to get people to be insured um and it's ironic uh obamacare requires it or at least makes it um expensive not to provide it what's what's wrong with it why not is, isn't that a good thing what's wrong with having uh, your employer provide your health Insurance. Well, it has several defects. One of the ones that gets the most um, attention is what we call the phenomenon of job lock, which is that uh, employer-sponsored health insurance isn't important your job uh, or lose your job, you lose your health insurance. If you're a highly paid professional, it's pretty certain that your next new job is going to have it. But if you're a working class, and especially if you're a low paid, uh, you may be stuck if you lose your employer sponsored health insurance. So uh, there is a, f a large academic literature and also a lot of, of anecdotes that there are a lot of people who have jobs that they don't like that uh, they would quit if they could do it without losing their insurance. So that's the job lock problem. Isn't is gated by COBRA, which is an acronym for something I don't know what it stands for, but COBRA is a requirement that even when you leave your job, your health insurance is extended for at least a temporary period of time, correct? COBRA was an attempt 
Most people regard Cobra as a failure, partly because of its short-term nature and partly because it's very expensive. Um, and typically, uh, employers pay about three quarters of health insurance. Uh, the average cost of employer-sponsored health insurance is about $20,000, of which employers pick about 14000 That's the annual cost. And under COBRA, you have to pay the whole cost yourself. So you can imagine a typical working class person going from a premium or out-of-pocket cost of $6,000 to $20,000 would find that pretty big shock. Well, let's go to the dollar number. And, and of course, the payment – when you say the employer pays fourteen and the employee pays six, that's the money that gets sent in. It's not who really pays it in the economic what we would call incidence of who the burden falls on. Presumably much of it falls on the worker in the form of lower wages. So the that's six right. understates the real cost to you as a worker. The the fourteen that the if you paid it if you got twenty thousand in wages you'd have to pay taxes on it so it's only a twenty thousand uh, dollar salary increase is only worth say something between I don't know thirteen of the average worker so better to give that in the form of health insurance where it's not taxable and uh, both the employer and the employee prefer that but that's um, uh, we'll talk about why that's a bad thing, which, like you say, most people are – Okay. Yeah, it's – I mean, it sounds like it's sort of benign at first because <clears throat> you're right that the employee bears just the cost of employer-sponsored health insurance because from the employer's point of view, what they're interested in, if they're going to hire you or not, they're interested in the total cost to them, to the company of hiring you, and the total cost cost includes wages and fringe benefits and about that. So in that sense, the employee bears the whole burden. But um, because it's tax deductible, then uh, depending on what your tax rate is, you get a better deal by taking part of your insurance in a tax deductible way. But that brings up the second real big problem uh, with employees. Employer-sponsored health insurance is that it's credible. Uh, it's not worth much unless you have. Uh, it's worth a lot more if you have a high uh, tax bracket. If you're in a high tax bracket, so if you're a uh, highly uh, professional, you get much more bang for your buck there. For uh, if you're low paid and are paying only payroll tax, uh, it's not not uh, nearly as good a deal. The result of that, uh, plus the fact that many low-paid workers are not offered that at all, <clears throat> the amount of money you get, uh, the amount of benefit you get is a lot less. <clears throat> According to some data put out by the um, Social Security Administration and analysis uh, of that, uh, <clears throat> for workers in the bottom fifth of the income, distribution, they get benefits of around dollars a year from employer-sponsored health insurance, while uh, workers in the top fifth of the health of the uh, uh, income distribution get benefits of about four thousand five hundred dollars. So this is definitely a benefit much skewed toward high-skilled, high-paid workers. The other part of it, which I don't think you talk about in your article, but for me has always been the. Uh, Equally important problem with this is that uh, when you're spending other people's money, you spend it less carefully. And uh, so when I'm getting a uh, a 20000 or a better way to say it, that's problem two is that when other people pay for what I have, I want more of it. So I want a bigger health plan than I would normally have if I had to pay for it myself. And when we say tax, you say tax. Deductible, it's really tax exempt, right? I get that uh, in that that twenty thousand dollar plan that I get, say uh, fourteen thousand is quote paid by the employer, six thousand out of pocket to me by me. But the truth is, is that 
the whole cost of it, I'm spared, say, 5000 of it in taxes at a 25% tax rate. And as a result, I want a bigger plan than I would have if I had to pay for the whole thing myself. So we've subsidized the generosity of health insurance in America, you know, so many years. And, uh, and, and that encourages more generous coverage, which encourages more use of the health care system, which encourages higher prices, which encourages people to pay for things they don't as they cost. Um, yes and no. Uh, this is a problem, but uh, there's two things I'd say about that. Number one is that uh, this problem of third party is not by any means unique to employer-sponsored insurance. That's true of, of any insurance, whatever its source. Uh, but more importantly, uh, that's offset to a considerable degree by the fact that the deductibles required uh, – for employer sponsored self insurance uh, health insurance have been going up uh, very uh, rapidly. Uh, that. Why uh, for, is that? For, for, exa- for example, uh, here I'm just looking at some data here between 2013 and 2018, um, <clears throat> the percentage of workers that had a deductible of $1,000 or more.
fiscal hazard and, and care of how you spend your money come into play, whether it's subsidized by federal tax policy or not. So if I have insurance, I have it inside it because it's paid for by somebody else. The insurance company knows that uh, and they try to make sure that it's money well spent, that the things I ask for the insurance to cover are good for my health and not just indulge self-indulgence, say, or not, a, and certainly not a, an example of fraud on the part of my uh, medical provider. But I start, started to wonder about whether that's a very, that, whether that's a very good system. And uh, say a new treatment, we've been talking about pharmaceutical pricing a little bit on the program recently, and I expect to do, do some more. You know, a new pharmaceutical, new drug gets developed that extends life by three months. Uh, mm -hmm. It's expected length is three months. It's now, uh, it's a version of a patented drug that is now about to go off patent. So the comparison is between a generic and a patented drug. The patented drug extends life three months more and it's expensive. And right. who sh who wants that? Well, most people don't want it if they had to pay it out of their, well, they wouldn't almost certainly if they had to pay for it out of their po own pocket. They don't want their kids to pay for it either if they have any care or love for their kids usually want that to pay for that. I would think the insurance company wouldn't want to pay for it, but the legal nexus uh, of, you know, getting the best care and then also the question of, of you know, so live it as a covered drug and they raise their premiums. Now, is there going to be the care taken? I mean, it's really a complex system. Like who's monitoring that to make sure that the that the insurance company is agreeing to things that are really of value. The answer is the employer to some extent. There's competition among insurance companies, but not so much. So anyway, I worry about all these things as as driving up the price of health care and not getting our, our money's worth. You're absolutely right, um, and you're certainly right to say it's a very complex problem. Uh, if we want, if I would, a couple of remarks I'd make. First of all, if we want to stick to the problem of employer uh, sponsor. Um, people that study these things more carefully than I do, uh, that is, people who are actually in the industry, uh, say that, that employers have a not doing these things very well. Yes, of course, they should have an incentive to uh, monitor their insurance companies and make sure that they're paying only for things of value. But in practice, employers themselves don't have the expertise to do that, number one. So they rely on middlemen. Uh, they go to uh, <clears throat> uh, to select a package that they think will be beneficial for you, and they take a fee. A company in turn goes out and uh, bargains with the providers. Uh, so right away – uh, employer-sponsored coverage includes an extra level of middlemen and, uh, between the person who's actually spending the money and the person who's making decisions on things you say about uh, whether a new drug uh, actually has a reasonable benefits. Um, You may have seen in the news there was a recent case in which three really big companies uh, uh, Amazon, JP Morgan, and uh, the way joined forces yep. to establish a new healthcare company that would manage benefits for, I don't know, several hundred thousand employees of these three companies. And the stock prices of traditional insurers fell uh, on this news. Um, but uh, again, there's some skepticism uh, as to whether or not this 
will really work. And commentators said, uh, just because you know an industry is un- underperforming and you have a lot of money to solve the problem doesn't mean you have a successful strategy. So anyhow, yeah, so that is a problem. Um, it's a problem with employer-sponsored insurance. Um, but it's a more general problem also because insurance companies themselves, although we think of them as big, powerful, some of them are very big and powerful, they actually are in an inferior bargaining position relative to health care providers. And so uh, even if it's an insurance company, you make your best effort uh, to provide uh, the most cost-effective care. Um, it's hard for the insurance companies to do because very often uh, the health, uh, the providers are more concentrated. For example, uh, bills are a very important category of providers. And in it, even in uh, um, middle-sized or large cities, you've really only got one or two hospitals to deal with. And as you probably have read, uh, uh, there's a trend toward uh, consolidation and concentration in hospitals. So it's... Uh, even where there is goodwill, and I'm not saying that, uh, that that insurance companies always have goodwill, but even when they do have goodwill, they're not in a, necessarily in a very strong bargaining position. Well, I've probably told this story before, but um, you know, I, I I went in once to a to a doctor to find out whether I wanted time with the to, to change doctors to this person. Mm-hmm. And uh, we chatted for five or ten minutes. We I made an appointment. We chatted for five or ten minutes, and then he said, "Well, let's do some kind of test." I forget what it was. It was just a sham. He just wanted to be able to bill this thirty minutes to insurance so that he would not lose money from chatting with me. If he had said to me, "You know, I, I'd like to uh, check," out, uh, said to him, "I want to find out whether I want to switch doctors to you." He said, well, it'll cost you $100 or $250 for my time to find out. I pr- probably would have said, well, I'll, maybe I'll need to look at some more recommendations or references. But instead, he, he did a, a boat, which I was incredibly uncomfortable because um, I knew he was just using it to scam the – it wasn't literally bogus. He did the test. But that kind of thing – and afterwards, I wonder whether I should say anything about, about it. I didn't switch to him. That kind of thing – it must happen, quote, all the time. The ability of an insurance company to monitor the performance of the thousands of doctors that are, you know, on the ground is is minimal. And as there are all kinds of things that become, I think, culturally acceptable to bill for, and others that aren't, because that would be ridiculous or embarrassing or unethical. But it, it's, you know, there's there's got to be creep in that in that experience that that more and more things are like – I mean if you ever look at your bill after you've had a, an exam uh, or a treatment or a, or a, you know some kind of uh, experience in the hospital, the things they – or at the dental office, the things that have done to you, you know, the categories, they've checked all the boxes and filled in all the blanks. But if you were paying for it out of your own pocket or if the insurance company had somebody alongside you at each of these experiences, it, it couldn't happen that way. Uh, yeah. Oh, boy, we're getting into some really big issues in the whole healthcare system uh, here. Uh, a couple of comments I'd make on your experience there, which is very common. Uh, number one, um, yes, uh, often these tests are ordered in, uh, we might say, bad faith by the doctors, uh, perhaps because they know that an office visit itself uh, is. Uh, going to be below, so they want a little extra money on the side, and they may uh, have a financial interest in the company doing the test and so forth. Um, There's another side of the coin, though, which is that when you ask doctors about this, they that uh, some of this excess testing is consumer-driven, that uh, if uh, people go to their doctor and they want these tests, example is the so-called PSA test, um, uh, prostate cancer, which uh, has been found to be practically worthless as a diagnostic tool, but when men go into their 
doctors uh, for it. They ask for this. They say, well, you know, maybe it's not very good, but shouldn't you? I'm worried about this. So, you know, you got that. Yeah, we've talked um, about that before, the evidence yeah. on it. And- so it's a, you know, it is a problem. Uh, one widely recommended solution for this is uh, to move away from fee-for-service medicine toward a bundled payment, so-called, or sometimes called value-based uh, care and uh what you pay for a whole package um, you know my if you're getting into personal anecdotes a couple of years ago i had shoulder surgery and i went to uh, a excellent hospital and it's called um, swedish hospital and i asked them up front i said how much is this going to cost me and i expected them not to be able to say because that's often the case, uh, because they're going to bill you for every saline bag and so forth. Uh, somewhat to my surprise, Swedish Hospital, the receptionist who I asked this, I've said, oh, uh, that'll cost you. And then she gave me a number in the low, uh, it was a high number, low, uh, seven figures. But uh, that was it. And that was the only thing that my insurance company was ever Build for was that some payment? Well, there is a new so phenomenon. More, more of that would help control the type of things you're you you've encouraged these unnecessary tests and overpriced saline bags and things like that. There is, and, but in some of them, are, I don't mean to suggest that it's that it's uh, fraud, literal fraud, like a lot for the saline bag. But a lot of times, it's just an extra. It's also the legal environment. Uh, that encourages doctors to quote thorough. Um, you know, my mom went to get some checkup after a heart procedure and they gave her an EKG. And I said, mom, why do that? Well, I always do when I go in. <laughs> you just had one three days before I had the surgery or something, whatever it was. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, that's just routine. You know, and routine means, yeah, there it goes. Just check that box, get that billing. Yeah, and I'm thinking right. that's not in your interest and it is in theirs. So <laughs> to say no. How did you even dream of the possibility of a thorough discussion of these issues in an hour? <laughs> uh, well, for our listeners who've heard dozens of hours on this before, this shit they've already no. what they've already talked uh, about. No, yeah, it, it's, 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 uh, no, one, it's a it's a the system, It's a very complicated system and has so many different problems that uh, you know, discussion of one inevitably. Leads to discussion of for sure, and we had uh, an episode which I recommend to listeners who may have missed it with Christy Ford Chapin on the evolution of of the healthcare system in the United States and some of the things that were done before the large role of government. Which um, you know, I, it always drives me nuts when people uh, say, "Well, we can't have a market based health system. Look how bad our system is." As if we have a market based health system, we don't. There are market forces in it, but it's he- heavily dominated by government subtle and not so subtle ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know, I've, I don't know how long you want to stick strictly to the employer. Uh, you can talk about <laughs> Go for the it. employer-based <laughs> healthcare system, but this broader question of what is, to what extent is it possible to have a market-based healthcare system is one that I've thought about and it's one we've worried about a lot about at the um, Niskanen Center, and a position I've sort of come down to is that you should have a market-based healthcare system to the greatest extent possible, uh, but it's clear that a 100% market-based healthcare system is not possible, and that's uh, true for two reasons. Uh, and have to do uh, in one way or another with the insurability of health care. Um, the first problem is that uh, health care spending is very asymmetrically distributed. And it goes by basically a, uh, uh, some people call it the 80-20 rule, that 20% of people account for 80% of health 
health care spending and top 1% account for about 10% of health care spending. Um, so <clears throat> the result of that is <clears throat> that there are people for whom it is true that their health care spending needs exceed their income, uh, in fact, exceed their entire lifetime income in a certain number of cases. Uh, now, of course, uh, it's also true that if your house burns down, um, the cost of rebuilding your house exceeds your income, and we solve that through insurance. But Healthcare needs are increasingly uninsurable because in order to be insurable, a risk has to be uh, fortuitous. It has to be due to random chance, but an increasing number of healthcare risks um, are predictable on the basis of uh, pre-existing conditions or uh, things that are determined, testing that's determined before you're born. So we have this combination of risks, which are risks that exceed your ability to pay, um, sometimes even on a lifetime basis, not just out of current income. And we have uninsurability. Uh, and two, they mean that uh, if we try to have a purely market-based healthcare system, uh, some people are not going to have access to treatment for um, Serious needs. So we have to find some solution to that, which we've been working on. Well, let me disagree a little bit, uh, or at least point out something I think people often forget. I know you don't forget it, but but people often do, which is uh, if the price of something exceeds everybody's lifetime income, that thing won't exist. Uh, and it's it, it will only exist if we decide to subsidize it, and we might decide to because it's so wonderful and so glorious. Um, you know, I have, we had um, fed episodes on pharmaceutical pricing, many pharmaceutical treatments now for cancer um, and other drug and other illnesses are, are in the seven figures, uh, say a hundred thousand dollars a year or more. And of course, who could afford that without insurance?
health care policy might be $100,000 a year so that it would exclude all but a very, very few people. Uh, this uh, system, if we used a system that went 10 or 15 percent out of pocket maximum, that's a definition of catastrophic. Uh, people in the uh, middle class would end up probably paying a comparable share of their income come to what they pay now, their financed insurance or ACA policies. And the idea would be that this would be given to you by the by government, covered by taxes for the and covered by the deductible? Yeah. Right now, if you look at where health care money comes from, um, the government sponsors uh, – the government pays for about half of the national health care bill, almost exactly half. Employers pay another 20% of that, which to my way of thinking is uh, largely also should be counted as part of the, uh, as, as part of the government's share since um, uh, the employer mandate is essentially a tax in kind on employers and then indirectly a tax in kind on workers. <clears throat> so you take this uh, 50, 20, 30 spread. So we're looking at the 30% uh, share that households now get. So if we, a, a starting point for discussion of this process, say, let's maintain this uh, balance between the government share and the private share, maintain the, the household share as a constant, uh, the 30% actually it also happens to be just an average for OECD countries. If we maintain that as constant, what can we buy for that? What we can buy for that without raising anybody's tax bill uh, is we can buy a policy that over uh, catastrophic needs of the whole population um, in, in, under some configuration of uh, universal catastrophic coverage. That's, that would be essentially we might call a budget neutral or revenue neutral version. Then by tweaking features of the universal catastrophic principle, that is by raising the out of pocket, by raising the low income cutoff below which people uh, get first dollar coverage, uh, by adding uh, maybe an income based premium in addition to the out of pocket costs, by all of these things, we could um, adjust upward or downward any of the three components, the government, the employer, or the uh, household share of spending. It strikes me as a huge improvement uh, relative to the current system. Uh, it would be a radical transformation, right? The, if we went to a market-based, you know, the, the argument you're making implicitly is if I'm understanding that, you know, you don't buy insurance for oil changes, you don't buy insurance for uh, physicals and things that are expected. Uh, you, what you buy insurance for is unexpected risk, unexpected events that you can't anticipate or reduce the chances. And for that, people would like to have, they don't want to be bankrupted by those things. They, you don't sleep well at night. So you need some kind of system. And I don't have any problem with encouraging a market in that kind of universal coverage. And subsidizing, this would be so much better than what we do now, subsidizing um, poorer people relative to rich people uh, to, to pay for that privately provided insurance coverage for, for catastrophic risks. The advantage of that over the current is that a private entity, assuming there was competition, if there's no competition, it doesn't help. But if there's competition, you at least have someone with an incentive to reduce innovation that is not not productive and incur it is productive. You know, I think the biggest you know we you talked earlier about that my argument was pushing towards single payer. That that's true. High, really expensive healthcare. One of the arguments that you can conclude from that is that you should have, have a government that negotiates that takes into account uh, efficacy and so on. I don't think that works very well. Uh, I, I do want to encourage listeners to listen to the Vincent Rajkumar episode where he talks about qualities and other ways of getting a fair price 
guys. I just think that's a Kafkaesque way to get there from here. I think it'd be much better to have a a more market based system. And if I understand what you're saying correctly, uh, this could get help us get there. Uh, yes, it could. And <clears throat> what it gets us is a system in which um, the you have part of the system running on a market basis and part running on not a market basis. But but in a sense, to believe that these um, the people that are spending their own money on healthcare spend more wisely, uh, not everybody spends more wisely, and not everybody would be spending their own money in the system. But it's sort of like what analogy what happens in the supermarket. Um, in the supermarket, not everybody spends their money wisely. A lot of people pull stuff off the shelf without looking at the price sticker or without reading the nutritional labels. But some people and the people that run the store know that a certain significant a part of their clientele uh, do watch the prices, do clip the coupons and so forth. And even a minority of people putting market providers uh, has some beneficial effect on the efficiency of the system and uh, helps curb some of the more obvious abuses. Yeah, and of course, when you have the high crazy patchwork system we have and we haven't talked about the state level restrictions on health care insurance, which some people argue have add to the cost because it's hard to have a national health care insurance company. Each state has regulations. Um, you know, when you have this this crazy patchwork system, it's incredibly inefficient to the point where there are providers out there now who who run a case for surgery. You know, yes. they post prices just like the real world, just like the supermarket. Yep. They say, you want a yep. knee? Here's the cost. You want a gallbladder taken out? Here's the cost. Yep. And they're, my impression is they're quite inexpensive. They're not quite expensive relative to the, to the other system, either because of competition or complexity or paperwork. I'm not, I don't know if anyone studied this, but do you have any, any thoughts on that? Uh, yes. Yeah, I know a little bit. But about these cash based are not always even for procedures as extensive as a knee replacement, but um, even more minor uh, things like doctor's visits or um, uh, you know getting your flu shot or whatever. Um, yeah, uh, like cash based clinics would flourish uh, in a system uh, of universal catastrophic care. The other thing is um, that uh, without going all way to single pay I'm not an enthusiast of or that if you mean by that a uh, single system that pays everybody's health care for everything like the uh, Sanders Medicare for all system but a single payer administratively simplification of the system would be a big benefit because um, it, the United States has unusually high administrative costs uh, for health Healthcare, which sometimes we have six or seven different healthcare systems, and we have Medicaid, Medicare, VA, uh, ACA, employer sponsored, and so forth. Another thing you mentioned that I think that be improved under universal catastrophic care would be the issue of portability, which is a big problem. And portability shows up in employer sponsored compensation, compensation um, uh, employer sponsored sponsored insurance, the phenomenon of job lock. But it's also true, you mentioned the, the diversity of systems among states. Uh, it also it puts uh, restraints on interstate mobility. Uh, used to be that people that defended the U.S. economy relative to, say, the European uh, economy would say, well, one of the great things about the American uh, economy is that we have a single everything throughout the whole country. So they have this marvelous mobility of resources within this enormous economy of 300 million people and uh, $3 trillion. Um, we're losing that mobility. Um, because healthcare is locking people into a single state. These programs, you can't transfer them to one state to another. And the data are there. If you look at data on interstate mobility, the labor market, it's plunging all over the place. 
you know, we've heard before about some of it's the fact that uh, rents in urban environments have risen dramatically. It's very hard yeah, to move. Uh, occupational licensing. Yeah, there's enough. a lot of barriers that are below, sort yeah. of below the radar that uh, are, are really interesting and, and sad to me that we've um, we've lost. I agree with you that we've lost a lot of the dynamism, at least the data says we have. Maybe people just don't like to move as much as they used to. I find that very hard to believe. Uh, I think something else has changed some but, of the things. that. Well, listen, I, I, I have a son-in-law who's a, a – a college professor uh, in Michigan, and um, he has uh, jo jobs, responded to job offers in other states that look attractive to him. And uh, in every case, he's eventually had to give up on that idea of moving to a better job. Uh, health insurance problems because they have a special needs child is getting some health assistant in the, from the state of Michigan, and that's non-portable. No other state, uh, you know, they can't they can't move to another state. But at best, have a long waiting period to get coverage uh, for this child's condition. Yeah, that's that's not ideal. Um, and as we're suggesting, there's a lot of factors. Where it's hard to know the magnitudes of any of them, but they're all uh, reducing the flow of people and uh, goods flow, flow pretty freely across state borders, but people don't so much anymore. And that's probably not a good thing. Let, let's close with um, the political reality that your ideal system, my ideal system, which would um, include a large role for uh, private philanthropic efforts, which I consider part of the market, but some people don't. People, some people mean market to mean profit-based. Uh, I, I think that's not the right way to think about it. I think we should think about voluntary systems versus top-down coercive ones. And um, but it, the the political realities are so complicated. You know, you point out at the beginning of your article that most people are happy with their employer-provided healthcare, and I'm thinking, well, sure they are. Somebody else is about a third of it's paid for by somebody else. Who wouldn't yeah, like that? It, well, so, actually, a large part of the reason people are happy with it is because they're healthy, uh, <laughs> so they haven't so they haven't used it. <laughs> right. That's yeah. That's my ideal yeah. insurance. Right. The one I haven't used. Yeah. So there's a paradox. Um, but yeah, if you're not going to use it, that someone else is paying for it, it's even better. Um, what What do you see as uh, realistic or optimistic signs on the horizon that that um, that some change might happen. I, I see the system is so complicated that I I often despair of of any uh, of marginal improvement. And marginal improvement is complicated because it's not obvious that um, it's always a step in the right direction. Given how given that complexity, I like to think that technology is going to help do a bit of an end around, and maybe Amazon, that Amazon, J.P. Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, innovation will leverage technology in a way that's innovative. And that's something they do know a little bit about, at least. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, it, the political situation, you can look at it as either, um, you know, half full or half empty. There are some discouraging things about it. The biggest discouragement <clears throat> is uh, something I call Reinhardt's Law, which is named after the late Uwe Reinhardt, one of the leading health economists in the country. And he used to say over and over again in different words that the problem is that every dollar of healthcare waste is a dollar of income for some healthcare provider. And uh, the healthcare providers, as a result, have such an army of lobbyists that it's hard to get anything done. So that is discouraging. However, there's some. Uh, I've gotten some encouragement in the universal, pr trying to promote universal catastrophic care. One of the things I find encouraging is the fact that this idea has been equally well received uh, on uh, the left and the right. Uh, I've published descriptions of this system in, um, you know, the 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 
American conservative, the Washington Examiner, uh, conservative outlets like this have published descriptions of it in uh, New York Times and um, uh, Fox and other more liberal outlets. And it gets good feedback uh, in both cases. <clears throat> so I think it's an idea that has some, at least on the philosophical or conceptual level, has some actual um, it, Cross the aisle appeal. Um, the Scan Center uh, has good contacts on Capitol Hill, and they get, uh, at least at the staffer level, uh, some good feedback on this concept as well. <clears throat> Secondly, um, <clears throat> universal catastrophic care is not. Um, to the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.